Greetings and welcome to Conversations at Noon on the Connecticut Freedom Trial. I'm Tammy Denise. In 1995, the General Assembly established the Connecticut Freedom Trial to, um, ex to acknowledge and designated sites of those in the African-American community with their freedom. And the categories are under, Underground Railroad, Abolition, Anti-Slavery, Sites of Consciousness, and the Amistad. The Amistad Real Amistad Committee oversees the Connecticut Freedom Trail. Today we have with us Dennis Colton of the Witness Stone Project. But before we get to Dennis, please um, look at the survey, leave us any questions or comments you may have. And um, please be aware that although the show is usually the fourth Tuesday of every month, next month's show will be December 6th, the second Tuesday for a year in review on the Connecticut Freedom Trail. Dennis Colton is the founder and executive director of the Witness Stone Project, and he is with us today to give us more information on how the project came about, the founding of it, as well as to say how and why we should be interested in having the Witness Stones in the community. Dennis, welcome. Thank you, Tammy. I'm excited to be here. And um, here we go. There's my slideshow. <laughs> so uh, again, I'm Dennis Colleton, the uh, founder and executive director of the Witness Stones Project. I, I have a lot of slides, so I might speak a little quickly, but um, uh, I can uh, drop a, a link to the slideshow uh, with the uh, Connecticut Freedom Trail, and they're welcome to uh, upload it to the um, to the website or or their uh, site. So um, I'm also a member of the Connecticut Freedom Trail, and that's how I got to know Tammy uh, early on. And it's exciting to be here to talk about our project. As you'll see later on, we're working across the state of Connecticut and other places in New England. And um, I want to get started the, uh, kind of sharing a little bit about what we do and, and really the basis of our work. Um, we started our project in 2017 in Guilford, Connecticut, with my friend Cindy Kozel and Doug Nigren. Uh, came to me with an idea of, after hearing me speak about slavery at the local library, they said, could we rem remember enslaved people the way Germans remember Jews who lived freely before they were kidnapped and murdered during the Holocaust? And, and with that, uh, that, that seed of an idea, I was able to look at my research and realize I had a way now to bring uh, the work that I had completed into the classroom. So that's, that was the birth of the Witness Stones Project. But you know, before we get started too much with that, we, we, I, I do like to share with folks our, our interpretation of New England uh, during the colonial period. Our, our reason to be, um, our reason for getting together um, and, and settling the Northeast was certainly for religious purposes, but also to make money. And the best place for us to make money was in trade with the uh, West Indies, where they were growing sugar. They were growing sugar and making so much profit from growing sugar that they weren't willing or able to feed their own enslaved people to <clears throat> provide horses uh, and livestock uh, to work on the plantations or uh, even to go fishing or things like that. So they got their livestock, they got their food, uh, including dried uh, or salted codfish and other things from New England and uh, also wood to make barrels to uh, put the sugar and molasses in and all those things came from new england and that's what people throughout connecticut were doing during the colonial and early american periods some specific details um, dr eric bartholomew kimball uh, adapted by dr uh, uh, Matt Warshower from central connecticut state university uh, looked at the inspector general's report prior to the uh, american revolution and found that a large percentage of the horses um, that went to the West Indies came from Connecticut. We're talking tens of thousands of horses, lots of sheep, lots of beef and pork, sometimes on the hoof, but oftentimes preserved in, in hams and, and, and barreled beef and corned beef, and sometimes beef mixed with tallow uh, for food <coughs> and other items. Uh, we also sent butter and cheese down. That was our way of preserving milk so that it could be shipped all the way to the West Indies, and, and tallow itself was, was sent there. Tallow, of course, can be used to make candles. It can be used uh, as a lubricant and certainly can be used to make soap. So tallow was uh, a byproduct, and I would explain to my students that it's that white stuff that you get after you cook the pot roast and put it in the oven. The next day, you have that hard, uh, white 
uh, layer that uh, over the over the uh, juice, and that's that's what tallow is. Um, most common imported items during this time period was one, one and a half million pounds of brown sugar at over a half million gallons of molasses. And I'll say just a little bit of rum because Connecticut was pretty good at making rum ourselves. Um, but we did need a lot of salt. Long Island Sound, you can get salt from Long Island Sound, but you really needed more of it to be able to uh, uh, make those hams, to uh, salt the fish, to preserve a lot of items. And I remember as a as a young man working, uh, or as a maybe preteen even working on dairy farms, you oftentimes fall in the salt lick because the more uh, salt the, the, the cows licked, uh, the more milk they produced. So we needed salt for many different reasons. Um, and if you look at the imports from the West Indies to Connecticut through the Customs Houses, uh, about half of everything imported into Connecticut was through the West Indies. Or from the West Indies. So that's how important the West Indies uh, work was. And, and we're able to find even more specific evidence of that. Um, here is a, uh, a kind of a bill of lading um, or um, kind of a consignment sheet from a fellow named Eli Foote, who happened to be Harriet Beecher Stowe's grandfather. He lived in Guilford and he was filling a vessel, the Sloop uh, Juno, with items uh, from local farmers and local lumbermen. Um, uh, local husbandmen uh, and everybody else in Guilford. And he was filling them with, with beef and tallow, with red oak barrel staves, with pressed hay, horses, oxen, uh, some more uh, staves. And to look at it in, in more details, you can see that a lot of these items were sent on consignment. So um, we have, um, you know, we have things from Thomas Griswold, from Tom, Tom, uh, Tim Rosser, Jabez Benton, Silas Benton, and these are all things that they shipped to, uh, or they brought to the uh, docks in Guilford, and they were put on the Sloop Juno, and uh, and Mr. Foote, Eli Foote, um, he brought them to the West Indies, not necessarily to one port, but he would go around and sell things as, as, as he could, kind of like a peddler or a merchant, and take on things as, as he purchased along the way. So you can see all these different things, including all the way over to the right here, it says, Ten and a half quarts of rum for people loading <laughs> the vessel. So uh, there was rum for loading and rum for the crew, and uh, and of course barrel stays, barrel stays, and barrel stays because you needed to have good hardwood to make the barrels, and they cut down pretty much all the trees in the West Indies in order to uh, grow sugar where they could. Um, you know, this our work is is based on a lot of other people's work. Certainly, uh, they early book. <clears throat> Ian Farrell, Joel Lang, and Jennifer Frank's book, Complicity, that they wrote uh, while they were still working for the uh, Hartford Current, is, is a fantastic book that helps us understand the centrality of the slavery and the slave trade in New England. Uh, Disowning Slavery was an earlier book um, from the uh, late 1990s by Joanne Pope Mellish, and she talks about, again, slavery here in Connecticut. And finally, uh, Dark Work by Christy Clark Bajara is a wonderful piece of, uh, of, of, um, of research that was done mainly about South, about, uh, South County and Newport, Rhode Island. But if you look at, if you read that book, it, um, it does echo on, uh, in places like Colchester and Stonington and Lebanon, Connecticut. So these are some of the books that we use to help us understand the, uh, what we're doing. And, and so a question we often have is how do we remember the formerly enslaved people? Well, and sometimes we have anecdotes. There, there are extant anecdotes about enslaved people that maybe were uh, taken down during the 1930s, uh, during the um, WPA, when, when they had researchers going from community to community collecting information. Sometimes uh, some communities we go to don't, don't remember at all that there was slavery. And we know there was slavery in every community in Connecticut, at least in 1790. So in Guilford, we only have two grave markers in the Old North uh, Cemetery in Guilford. And, uh, and they're both for individuals named Shem, different men. But, uh, but otherwise, it's hard to find the grave marker for an enslaved person. Um, in, in Greenwich, we have two for Hester uh, Mead and Kansas Bush. That's a mother and daughter that Hester uh, uh, gained enough uh, money over her life that when she died, she wanted to put a gravestone in for both her mother and, and herself. So she, she did that. Um, and we have Hartford's ancient burial ground where we have many, many records, but very few markers for, for formerly, for enslaved or formerly enslaved people. And then sometimes we have places that had names that designated African-Americans were there, but they weren't names that we want to repeat. 
So um, in Guilford, um, North Street was formerly Edward Lane, and, and it was good that they changed it, but it, it, it is sad that we've kind of erased the evidence of, of enslaved people or free blacks on in that part of Guilford. Um, in Milford, they did a little bit better job where they took a, a pond that had an Edward name, and they changed it to Walker Pond, named after the first African-American uh, preacher in, in Milford. Uh, Reverend Walker. So we see ways that communities uh, re, uh, disremember and re-remember their, their uh, slavery and free black communities. Um, other places we find information, some of these uh, books that we have, uh, the autobiography of Lyman Beecher, who talks about slavery in North Guilford, uh, Chains Unbound, Jeffrey Bingham Mead from uh, Greenwich, uh, probably a decade or two ago, scraped the uh, property records in the Greenwich Town Hall and found dozens or dozens and um, over a dozen, um, I think up to two dozen records of, of um, enslaved people's emancipation telling you the name of the enslaved person, the name of the enslaver, um, and, and other details about their life. So this is a rich piece that you can find online if you look on your chains on my own. And then we find things like property records and um, probate records and, and other types of records that we can click on, but we're not going to do that today, that help us understand where it's, uh, who enslaved people were, how they were valued, and, and what happened to them at, at the death of their enslaver. So um, probate records help us with that. Property records help us with that. Anecdotes are helpful. We don't always accept everything that's written in the anecdote, but we do grab the information that's important. We call that reading against the grain. Let's get the details out of there but let's not take the opinions of somebody from maybe two centuries ago, what they thought of slavery. Uh, towns collected vital records, um, and vital records are very important for our work. Um, in many towns, they sent their vital records to Hartford, and Hartford um, um, indexed the vital records, and those indexed vital records can be found on Ancestry, and you can search by name, by community for enslaved people, or free blacks through this uh, through these vital records. Census data is helpful, but census data doesn't, um, in Connecticut doesn't give us the name of the enslaved person, uh, but it does give us the name of the enslaver. And then sometimes we make our own records. In Guilford, we had a 100-year listing of people who died in Guilford, and I extract, extracted out all the people of color and made a list of them and what was said about them, and that record is, can be used to help form families and help um, with genealogical type work that we do to do this project. Um, there's some interesting books out there that you wouldn't think to look at, but in, in um, Connecticut and in, in the 13 colonies, some of the enslaved people fought for the British during the American Revolution. So a great place to find information is in this uh, information associated with the uh, Nova Scotia Book of Negroes. And Sir Guy Carleton in 1783 filled vessels with um, American loyalists, sometimes American loyalists and slave persons, but also free blacks who fought on the side of the British and, and shipped them up to um, Nova Scotia and, and, and what nowadays we call St. Uh, John's, New Brunswick, <coughs> uh, to settle. And uh, in these records, we find uh, information that helps us identify enslaved people, help us identify enslavers, and help us understand where the rest of the story took place. We always want to know what happened to our enslaved people, and sometimes we can find those, that information through uh, our research. Um, this is uh, these are great uh, places to find information, too. As Just as the town sent their vital records to the state to be uh, indexed, the, and it's called the Barber, uh, Barber's Collection, um, the churches, especially the congregational churches and some Episcopal churches, sent their records to the Hartford. And those records can be found at the Connecticut State Library in the genealogical section, but also can be found on Ancestry where it's searchable uh, by, by name. So what we find in church records, sometimes enslaved people are listed at the back because they don't have a surname. So all the people without a surname end up in the back. And here we find a page from um, East Haven's um, church records, and here we have, uh, starting with the page 212, we have Pink, Mary Stepna, 
service of Captain Morris and Isaac Forbes, and we have put Whitmerstone Memorials at the site of the Party Morris House uh, for Pink and Stepna. We have Pomp um, and Reuben and uh, Rose and Sarah. Uh, well, this one probably is an enslaved person. Let's just see some others. Uh, Style, Child of Dick Negro. Um, Sybil, uh, Mary Cork, Servants of July, Leal uh, Forbes, and um, Tom and uh, Tony, both servants, uh, also are listed here. In other records, we find enslaved people sometimes in the vital records under, not only under no surname, but we find them under the names of the enslavers. So it says here, David Bush had Negroes, Phyllis and Patience, uh, uh, Phyllis, daughter of Patience, Millie, daughter of Patience, Rose, daughter of Patience, uh, Lucy, daughter of Patience, Nancy, daughter of Patience, and Cole, son of Patience. And David had also had Negroes, Jack, son of Candace, and Hester, daughter of Candace, and we saw Hester and Candace's records uh, or their gravestones separately. But again, with these records, we can we can use these to uh, identify enslaved people. Sometimes in in the um, situation in Greenwich, Connecticut, Cull takes on the last name of Bush, and therefore we can we can trace the Cull uh, Cull Bush's family longer than if if we just take it have a name like Sybil or Pink. When we were investigating Sybil and Pink, uh, Seth Stepna and Pink, we found that um, in the records, by chance, we found that Stepna was either taken or given the last name of Primus, and therefore we could follow Stepna and Primus for probably 30 or 40 years, especially, I mean, Stepna, uh, Primus, and Pink Primus for 30 or 40 years after their freedom. So that, that was a, a, a kind of a lucky thing that happens to researchers when you're in the right place. But... Uh, we were we were able to find where Pink and Stepna lived, uh, and we know that they were held in captivity in what is now New Haven, but the uh, Party Morris House is uh, used to be uh, East Haven, and that's a whole different story if you want to know why Morris Cove and the annex became uh, part of New Haven. Uh, these are you know, one of the places to find what we call the high tide of slavery. It was right about the time of the American Revolution. So right before the revolution, we had uh, many uh, enslaved people across Connecticut. And right here, it shows that in what was then New Haven County was about 925 enslaved people. And out of that, um, I'm going to do some uh, mental math here, so I apologize. But we have about, uh, out of that, probably about 55 or, or 60 were were Indians, uh, people of color. This is the last census in New England where Indians are are, um, are are enumerated. So uh, so we have about so we have about 875 uh, people of color, and we can see in our communities that, um, for instance, Guilford has 84, but had one of the larger indigenous populations. So if you subtract 23 from 84, you end up with 61 people of color. So we believe these 61 people of color were mostly enslaved at this time, but the vast majority of them. Now, of course, Guilford included Madison, Brantford included North, um, North Brantford, Durham included uh, parts of Middlefield, Wallingford included uh, Cheshire, New Haven included East Haven, West Haven, uh, Milford included Orange, um, so uh, and maybe parts of West Haven. So we can see that these communities were bigger at the time, but we noticed that the biggest community uh, that had the most people uh, was New Haven, and it had the most enslaved people also. <laughs> Um, the second largest community um, had the second most enslaved people. Now, it doesn't work that way with Walling, uh, Waterbury. You would expect to have the third most enslaved people, and it doesn't, it doesn't work out that way. And, uh, different communities had different amounts of enslaved people having to do with the wealth of the community, having to do with the means of um, production, um, and it had to do with, uh, you know, certainly access to water and things like that, too. But we know inland communities sometimes had a lot of enslaved people because of the wealth of the community and the means of production, which oftentimes was animal husbandry. Um, this is a uh, Hartford-centric uh, one. We know that we're missing a couple counties like Middlesex County and maybe Tallinn County. So towns like Tallinn end up in Hartford County here. But the um, largest uh, groups of enslaved people looking at this, uh, you would think it would be Hartford, but it is uh, Colchester. And um, and then we have uh, Middletown 
and we have um, Weathersfield. So the, these communities had large groups of enslaved people, sometimes because of this animal husbandry, sometimes access to you know, saltwater ports like Middletown and um, and Weathersfield because Weathersfield was such a big community at the time, and they were <clears throat> and they were producing those red onions. Many of them were going to the plantations in the American South and in the West Indies. So the, these numbers show you. Whereas Willington and um, in Stafford, there was only one, or uh, Summers, you know, we have one, one, two, or three. So some of these towns, more the hilly, the hill towns and places like that there's going to be lower numbers of enslaved people. And, and sometimes there was a preacher in that town that was preaching against slavery. So we can see that that did have an effect on, on slavery too. Uh, when we, we do our project, um, you know, we also, we like to prove in a sense our case that we do have this annotated work cited for a lot of the works, work that has been spoken about and done about slavery in New England. These are all uh, important uh, books that were some written by, um, some written by enslaved people themselves, like Jeffrey Brace's uh, Wide African Slave and Venture Smith's uh, autobiography, as well as James Mars's autobiography. Very, very important works. But also we have other uh, other studies, and uh, including down at the bottom here, we have For Adam's Sake that talks about the he uh, Joshua Hempstead's diary and and how he um, spoke you know, or wrote a lot about his relationship with Adam, which who was this enslaved man. So. Uh, lots of different books out there, and um, and so if you want to look at this, I can again share this, and hopefully this uh, the links will all be clickable for uh, for people to look at what our work site it is. Um, so if slavery was critical to development in our country, if slavery shaped the beliefs about race in our country, if slavery was the main cause of the Civil War, and if the enslaved resisted their bonds and still contributed to the growth of our country, how can we remember and restore the history of the enslaved? And, and that's kind of the basis of this project. How can we remember uh, enslaved, slavery? And also to take that step back and say, this is not what I was taught. I was taught that slavery was one of the main causes of the Civil War. Well, <clears throat> I would say scholars and um, most people who study uh, the American Civil War and study uh, the, the 19th century will tell you that now slavery was the main cause of the Civil War, just like a real estate agent will say, um, location, location, location is is why you know how you price a house or why or what are the most three most important things. Other things are important too, but the three you know the most important cause of the Civil War by far was was slavery, uh, keeping slavery um, uh, in the South and allowing it to spread west. And I think for the North, it was initially the Civil War wasn't about ending slavery in the South. It was just uh, ending the spread of slavery. The people in the North didn't want to compete with um, slave economies as, as we, as people, began to move move west. And and that was the initial, I think, resistance to slavery until our sons were coming back in the zinc boxes uh, from uh, from the battlefields, and then then we were fighting for uh, fighting for different reasons, <laughs> and knowing that ending slavery would end the Civil War. Um, so what are we taught in the North? That slavery occurred in the South, racism began in the South, segregation happened in the South. The South needs to solve the problems associated with racism. I grew up in Massachusetts. I taught middle school in Connecticut for 25 years. And I would say for most of my life, including most of my teaching life, I thought that slavery was a Southern issue. And when I realized, and I found, not, not through books and not through everything else, but just found through the primary documents and the records that I was aimed at uh, from Joel Heland of the town historian in Guilford when I found those records and started to search for answers when I realized that slavery began in the North and then, of course, racism also originated, originated in the North and racial se segregation is present here and, and we need to change how we view our local society. If we believe that all the, all the things that are happening in Connecticut today, all the things that are happening in the Northeast today are because of coincidence or because um, of what we used to call de facto segregation, we, we know better now. So if we know that this the society we have was done on purpose, then how do we 
start to make the changes. Well, we, we, we can start to make the changes if we understand what the past was like. So our project was inspired by the Strobelstein project in Germany and Berlin. There are now 70,000 stones across Central Europe. There's, what we do is we research enslavement, educate the students, and engage the citizenry. We, we work with the students using these primary documents so they tell the stories of enslaved people. And then they share those stories with the community. Last year, with a partnership with the Connecticut uh, Old State House and the um, uh, Creck Art School um, and the First Church in Hartford, we, uh, Center Church in Hartford, we installed uh, two witness notes memorials here through this project. So this is, these are things that uh, our communities are able to do and hearing the children tell the stories. When I say children, some of them as you know, old as, as high school seniors, it, it becomes, uh, at least to me, more meaningful. Um, we were thrilled when we found out last, about two weeks ago, that um, Clint Smith, the author and, um, and writer for the um, Atlantic Magazine, talked about the Witness Notes Project when he was talking about how people in Germany remember the Holocaust versus the way people in America remember slavery. And he said, there are examples of communities in the U.S. that are not waiting for the government to tell them they should build a memorial or they should create sites of public memory. I think one of the most compelling is a group of a group in Connecticut that's doing the Witness Stones Project based on the Stumbling Stones Project in Germany. Middle and high school students are placing stones to mark the places where enslaved people lived, worked, and worshipped. And um, it, it was exciting to hear him say that and, and also... It's a challenge, uh, it's a little humbling, but it's also a challenge for us to continue this project at, at, a, at a meaningful level. We're not doing this to do something and walk away. We're doing this to add to the knowledge of the community. Where we, I, I think a lot of times our concept in our country is sometimes we um, remember um, that we want to reconcile past but we realize we can't reconcile the past until we tell the truth and, and this is what our project is aiming at um, so what do we do with the kids well first we we bring the teachers through a, a, a workshop a three session workshop and we the witness notes project oftentimes doesn't teach we don't teach the kids we teach the teachers to bring this to the kids and we do the research and make it accessible <clears throat> what we found in order for students to look at a primary document, to look at vital records or a will or probate inventory or, or even read an anecdote, we have to give them lenses to use. Just like, um, you know, to use a microscope, you have to have the right lens to be able to see what you're looking at. And the lenses we've developed are dehumanization, treatment of enslaved, paternalism, economics of slavery, and human agency and resistance. We need all five of those themes to understand what slavery was like, knowing that the most important theme is human agency and resistance. We're not here to re-enslave uh, the, the, the victims of slavery. We're not here to re-victimize them. We're here to tell their stories and to tell a humanizing story, which is separate than what we have been told and separate from what, um, what the how we were able to enslave people to begin with. You can only enslave people if you get to the point of of separating their humanity from them. And, and Hitler was very good at doing that uh, during the Holocaust. Not good in, in, in a positive way, but he was effective and his people were effective at separating Jewish people from their humanity. Um, I, I remember seeing... Um, uh, images, uh, cartoons of Irish people when they first immigrated, showing them like carrying like clubs and dragging their knuckles as if they were cavemen. Um, and we see that with African Americans. Uh, sometimes, you know, people of color are still dehumanized. Um, there was a um, recent administration where uh, people crossing the border were called were being called rapists and murderers and gang members and drug dealers at people crossing the border and then three months later we 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 saw their children in cages uh we first you had to dehumanize the people crossing the border before you could cha cage their children 
So that's part of, of the process that we we try to separate, we try to identify the dehumanization that happened in the past that allowed people to feel it was okay to enslave people. It was never okay. It was always wrong. And we just have to read the Bible to realize that, it's, that the enslavement of the Israelites was always wrong. It doesn't mean that the Israelites didn't enslave other people, but my myself being enslaved was always wrong and and that's something we can uh, talk about a little bit later the idea of separating society by the other and and the rest of us is what is what allows us to uh, uh, treat people in, a, in, a, in an inappropriate way um, so we use this jigsaw activity in the classroom where one group of kids would study dehumanization using the documents and other do treatment of enslaved and other do agency and resistance and then the groups of students would teach them back to each other. So at the end of the jigsaw activity, they get to see like a jigsaw puzzle, the whole picture of what slavery looked like here in Connecticut and in, in the Northeast. Uh, so it's, it, it is something that, you know, I, I always enjoy doing as a teacher. There's other activities that are similar, like think, pair, share, where a, a, a one student would look at something and try to develop an understanding. They would, um, talk about that with another student and then we'll share it with a, with a larger group and what we're doing here is trying to get the kids to uh, wrestle with these documents wrestle with the understanding before they share it with the other groups of students and, and hearing their understanding from each other is oftentimes more powerful than hearing it from a old gray-haired teacher there's a lot of those young teachers too but um so treatment of enslaved in the north uh sold by white owners and historians uh lenient with many freedoms paternalistic with masters guiding the morals of slaves, treatment as part of a family, a care for life. But according to slave narratives by Venture Smith, James Morris, Jeffrey Brace, these are, these are like autobiographies and a story told by Gad Asher by his grandson, uh, Reverend Jeremiah Asher, there was whippings, beatings, and hog times, double crossings and cheating. Um, abandonment of aged youth sold south and severe punishment for minor crimes. This is what people of color are saying what slavery looked like in Connecticut, not what the enslavers were saying because they were, and it's may, oftentimes when you read their writings, they're trying to justify why they held another human being in captivity and sometimes treated like them like domestic animals. Um, you know, we were able to tell, you know, we have these complicated stories sometimes in Suffield. We have the story of um, Tamar, who was purchased by Venture Smith's son and, and, and she became his wife. And we have documents associated with that. But we also have documents associated with, um, with <clears throat> Tamar leaving her husband, uh, Solomon Smith, about 10 years later to help us. And that helped us understand that, that Tamar maybe showed her agency through her marriage and again showed her agency by leaving her husband who may have been abusive. Um, Agency is a word that not everybody uses, but it, it is a powerful word. We, we like to use agency because human agency is how one displays the desire to take control or to control their lives. Agency can come in the form of resistance. It can also be demonstrated through one's capacity to control their circumstances. So agency could be refusing to work, sabotaging work, or running away. It also can be working hard to gain your freedom, um, earning money, gaining, purchasing one's own freedom, having children, and surviving captivity. We're not here to judge that a soldier who fought on the American side of the American Revolution is uh, a better image of agency than a, a soldier who, who served the um, served on the British side. We're not here to say somebody who poisoned their enslaver was superior to somebody who did everything they were supposed to do to gain their freedom. <clears throat> we're just here to say that. In, within the confines of slavery, within the confines of a society that kept people of color down, we are going to work really, really hard to extract the stories of agency and resistance from, from the records. Um, we did contribute uh, very um, in a great way to the Black and Latino Studies course, and what we try to do is share with them the story of one enslaved person, and it, it's amazing that we had in Connecticut uh, slave kings and governors, and also in parts of Rhode Island and maybe southeastern Massachusetts. When talking to people who have gone to Africa, they say it resembles um, the, uh, 
uh, West African uh, village life where uh, there would be a slave, there would be a king or, um, or a leader in that village. Um, and we, we find that Moses was enslaved in Guilford and he, uh, according to Lyman Beecher, Harry Beecher Stowe's father, he kept the accounts, ran the farm, rang the church bell, was a factotum, which means jack of all trade, sent priest father's son Johnny to college. That college was called Yale, was a king of the locally enslaved and chose to remain enslaved because he was king. Um, this, is, this was written by Lyman Beecher probably about um, 30 years after the death of Moses and, and, and Moses was alive while Lyman Beecher was living in Guilford. So, and you can see on the left all the documents we have associated with, with Moses um, that help us understand his life, including <clears throat> the fact that he was mentioned directly or indirectly in three wills. He shows up in probate inventories and he's discussed, uh, he, he, his story is, is somewhat of a twice told tale in that community. Um, we know that Moses um, was part of this family that um, he had one sibling out of eight that had a had a child, so he only had one um, um, nephew. His name was Caesar, and Caesar. Um, there are many generations after Caesar, and the ninth generation in that family in um, enslaved in the United States. The ninth generation. We know they were enslaved starting in 1727 is Pat Wilson Phineas on the right, who was the former state representative from the 53rd District, uh, state commissioner of social services for Connecticut and Denver, Colorado. And her dad was a Tuskegee Airman. So in the family of Moses, we have on the right, his uh, fifth great niece and his fourth uh, great nephew. So we have this wonderful, interesting family um, that contributed uh, Colonel Wilson contributed, he, he served as a Tuskegee Airman, he served in Korea and Vietnam uh, before he retired to working at Yukon in uh, human, uh, human, human relations. And, um, and, we ha and we have other, other members of this family, including a, a, a weather prophet, there was a, a relative, uh, an uncle, I will say, a, a, third great uncle who died in Africa looking for homes for free slaves. He was a Presbyterian minister. And it's this amazing family who, whose stories have been hidden or, or, or have been collecting dust until we were able to collect information and find Pat Wilson Phineas. And now she's the chair of the Witness Stones uh, Board of Directors and a wonderful contributor because we can only, um, we can only tell stories that we, um, you know, we can only collect stories, we can only understand uh, African American history through our own eyes, but having people like Pat Wilson Phineas help us understand, help us interpret information, help us see, help us tell her story, her family story, is very powerful for us. <clears throat> um, and this is too much time we have. I think we're going to skip this, but we do have a nice excerpt um, about um, uh, from the um, Connecticut. Uh, it's really New England Public Radio that we're going to. We'll probably skip to another time because I think we're going to. If I get through all my slides, I'll be lucky. <laughs> so we'll do that. But if we have time at the end, I'll, I'll play this this this, uh, this piece. Uh, so what are we doing? You know, we we're teaching local slavery in your community. Uh, you can see the map on the right. All the different places we we. Done the Witness Stones project. Certainly, Norwich is surrounded by other uh, towns that send their kids to Norwich Free Academy. But we're working in the southwest corner and the northeast corner in Stonington um, and um, Norfolk and, and Salisbury. Um, we're doing a lot of things along the Connecticut River, which we're very excited about. We're hoping to hear soon about a project in Manchester. Uh, we just partnered with the um, Heart, uh, the Connecticut uh, Episcopal Diocese to do uh, multiple projects across the state. And we're beginning to work with Connecticut Landmarks for projects in both New London and in uh, Bethlehem, Connecticut. Uh, it, we work with private schools, we work with public schools. We probably taught more public school students and work with more private schools. <clears throat> we're beginning to partner with churches across the state as they come to terms with their relationships with slavery, especially the 
Episcopal <coughs> and congregational churches that have um, were complicit with slavery here in Connecticut. Um, and we're also working in other states. And so we use early censuses, church records, vital records, early histories, runaway advertisements are all ways that we are able to um, do that. We also, um, these anecdotes are, are very, very interesting. Uh, family histories are also interesting too. We try to um, partner with, um, with local organizations also like the NAACP, the Daughters of the American Revolution and, and other organizations that have a stakehold in this. Um, we also try to, we try to bring in churches and uh, especially um, historically black churches to be part of the conversations when we come into communities. These are some of the organizations that we've worked with and there's certainly more, um, but you can see it's, it's pretty extensive. Uh, recently, we, we installed 19 Witness Stones Memorial at Historic Deerfield, which was our probably our biggest single day um, installation ceremony up there. And they're uh, planning on using that as part of their interpretation of their site. They've done a great job interpreting the indigenous community um, in the Deerfield River Valley. And now they're going to be talking about slavery there too. Um, but you can see some of these organizations might be in your towns and some of them are statewide organizations like the Connecticut Council for Social Studies. Uh, we do have an office at the Central Connecticut State University History Department and um, we're excited to partner with them to try to begin to teach teachers before they graduate from college about this history and about what happened in Connecticut during the late colonial and early American period. So they aren't having to relearn this after they graduate from college. Um, this just happened last week. We, we installed some Witness Stones Memorials and um, in Ridgefield, Connecticut, partnering with the uh, con um, with the Ridgefield Historical Society and the two Ridgefield Middle Schools, and 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 I just got this note from the teacher, and I, I just almost you know I, I I was so honored to be able to work with this teacher and the other teachers in Ridgefield, but also for her to come back and say, <clears throat> um, you know how you know how this type of work is really. Uh, important to the teachers as well as the students to start to look at a, a true vision of slavery. The superintendent in, in, in Ridgefield said that she was excited because the kids went from being kind of um, consumers of history to be able to create history. So that's that's a very important part of this, um, is, is this creation of history that happens from the students because they take these primary documents and try to restore the history and honor the humanity of enslaved people who lived in our communities. Um, we're working with, um, you know, we've worked with the, um, with the state uh, CERC, uh, State Educational Resource Center, to uh, develop the um, Black and Latino Studies course. And we're also working with the um, um, Connecticut Council for Social Studies on the K-12 Social Studies Standards. This is a map that, um, it's an old, old map of Connecticut, but it shows you in, um, the 1790 census and enslaved people in the 1790 census, uh, where where they were located, and certainly, you know, I this um, the two places that are kind of a little messy is New London County kind of came in as one county, so this is the amount of enslaved people in the entire county of New London, and up here a good part of Litchfield County was included in this, as you can see by the large section. But you also see there were less towns in those days. So 41 is, is Guilford and Madison. Um, I think the, uh, you know, 52 is maybe Wallingford and Cheshire and, and other, 113 is, um, is Stamford, Darien, um, New Canaan, and maybe even, uh, maybe even parts of Wilton. So, uh, these, these numbers are a little messy, but it does help you understand that slavery was in, you know, it was out, it was, it was across the state and it was from corner to corner and there was no community that was uh, immune to trying to benefit from enslaved people. Um, so we can see, um, and, you know, this is, these are some other examples. So we have coffee. Um, this is a, a, a stone that was uh, put in 
uh, Danielson, Killingly, Connecticut, Mary Danielson went to Boston in 1728 and purchased coffee from a slave trader there. This is the um, Bush Holly house where they have evidence of, of 15 enslaved people living in that household. Party Morris, and this is in Greenwich, Party Morris House in Morris Cove, which used to be East Haven, is now New Haven. There's evidence of, I think, at least a half dozen enslaved people living at this house. Uh, and this is Pink, who was enslaved at, at that house. And then we have Joaquim, uh, which is a very interesting story because it, it probably starts in Africa, goes to Guadalupe, uh, moves to New London, uh, and then to Guilford where his enslaver, uh, Nicholas Loisel, uh, was in, um, um, escaped the slave uprisings rises in the West Indies, traveled to Connecticut where there was a French consulate and settled here and continued to trade in the West Indies. So we can see these interesting records that they have in the New London uh, property records that are uh, excerpts or, or uh, copies of the records from the French consulate that allowed Joaquin and, um, and Joachim to be, be free. So we have these records, interesting stories that we can tell about the enslaved people, <clears throat> looking at both the local history and the history of the region uh, and what was happening. And this is um, our final slide. So I guess I'm doing okay time-wise. And, um, and you can see the different aspects of that. You can see I have my name there and, and you know, the work, but I just want to give a little anecdote about Latouse. Latouse was an enslaved woman who was held in captivity in East Guilford, otherwise known as Madison, by Reverend Jonathan Todd, who felt that at his death that he should free his enslaved people. And um, so he, when he died in 1791, his enslaved people were freed and they were given property. Um, and, and they were given property conditionally that if they were, you know, were, did not end up in the poorhouse and they were, you know, respectful and did everything right, they could keep that property. But in 1792, a law came out saying that if you have an enslaved person in Connecticut and they're of good health and they're between 25 and 45 and they want to be freed and they pass an inspection or almost a physical by the um, either the, uh, the town magistrates or selectmen, you could free them and not be responsible for them in their old age. So we see here that Jonathan Todd's nephew goes and frees Latouse a second time, so he wouldn't be responsible for Latouse in her old age. Later on, we, we, we have lots of records about Latouse and her children, and we find that you know, her, her, her children were bound out from her when she ended up in the poorhouse. It doesn't look like she ever gained the property that she was promised. But when we were working on what we should put down for Latouse's kind of occupation, I wanted to put Weaver and Spinner because we can see that she inherited weaving items, you know, like a loom and, and spinning wheels and stuff like that. And the kids wanted to put mother in. And I went back and said, can we put like weaver and mother? And the kids said, well, can we put mother and weaver? And I realized I'm arguing with these students who really started to humanize Latouse enough that they compared her to their own mother. And I just needed to stop talking and let the kids, you know, really take the lead here. Because, you know, that's what we're trying to do is that if, if our kids, um, if our, if our kids can relate to people historically of color um, and imagine how that changes, how, how maybe the, the, the white children look at the history of, of, of Connecticut in the, in the country, and imagine being a, a, a student of color and never having seen someone like them in the history books, and now they get to meet a person like Latouse or, or Joaquim or somebody else who was an important part of Connecticut's history and how that can have an effect on, on their feelings and on what life, what they think about our, our history. So uh, I think our job is to is to go out there and, and to tell these truths and to work with the students to tell the truths. And, and, and then from there, we hope that maybe they or others or the next generation will take this information and be able to make the changes that our society would benefit from. So that's, I'm going to stop talking for now. So Tammy, if you want to, I saw some questions come up, but um, if you want to help me out with them, that would be great. Oh, sure. All right. Um, let's start with Larry. He wants to know what was the population of black people in Connecticut as a percentage um, of total from 1800 on? Um, I'll say that during the time of slavery, the percentage of African-Americans is about 3% across the state of Connecticut. 
that would be some communities might have might have had 15 um, to 20 percent and other communities might have less than one percent uh, but about three percent is a good number to go with during the time of slavery I, I really don't have those numbers um, you know across you could go and, and research the census data and there's books published that you know in the libraries that have all that census data and they could help you out with those details okay thank you so much for that question um i have a question from zakia it's actually i'll i'll make it um one question and two questions into one um it's about descendants um we know that sometimes people think descendants are not known and so she wants to know is how do you go about including descendants in your research and why not have them come into the school to talk about their experience as um, descendants well that's an excellent question and um you know we're less that you know some of the early stories we told were uh, the family of pat wilson phineas and she was able to share her histories uh she is oftentimes our most she's our most popular speaker at our installation ceremonies and uh, she does offer to zoom in the classroom with the kids um, during um, when they're researching this. We also have, um, uh, have met and, and spoken with descendants of Venture Smith, and they were involved with our work up in Suffield. We were looking at Tamar. <clears throat> and we also um, recently met um, the descendants of uh, Caesar Peters from Hebron. And there was a wonderful group of them, um, and and they came to our installation ceremonies and shared their understandings and their feelings with the kids. So we do that as much as possible, and we're trying. You know, when we reach a community, we 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 can't. You know, we're really focusing on probably that 1720 to 1820 period of slavery in Connecticut. And when the stories allow us to, we we search further, but we we do get stuck, just like uh, people get stuck doing this research. Uh, we have been in contact with descendants of the Bush uh, enslaved people at the Bush Holly House, and we want to bring them into work. Uh, we're working with um, uh, the, the de descendants of Friday Trueheart, and uh, when we work uh, the work we're doing in Central New Jersey, so we're doing a lot of that as much as we can, and we hope to the kids love to be able to speak with descendants. It makes it that much more real uh, for them, and the descendants so far have really enjoyed interacting with the kids. Okay, thank you for that. Um, I have a question in regards to going into the communities and using the students or utilizing the students and teaching them. How do you go about utilizing the African-American students and what is the uh, demographics of working with African-American students versus non-African-American students? And if there is a population that does not have as many, how do you go about including? Yeah, that's, um, I, it, I, I don't know if I got the whole question. I, I heard you, but I don't know if I understand the whole question. I'll, I'll say that um, the best, not everybody agrees with me, but I believe the best people to teach um, African-American students are their teachers. So we don't we don't teach the African American students. We teach their teachers. We talk to the teachers about items that might be sensitive to their students. So if we're talking about something that includes, um, you know, mixed race children of enslaved women, uh, there's there might be a sensitivity there that, that you know, rape could be a word you use or it might be a word you don't use in your classroom. But I we 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 allow the teachers to make those decisions. Um, we share our curriculum with them, but we expect them to make it their own and um, I'll just say that when we have worked with schools uh, that are uh, more African-American students than we normally do um, I, I'm, I usually get overwhelmed by their responses to it they for our white kids this is history for African-American kids it's kind of their history and some of them really react strongly we've had some installation ceremonies um, in both uh, New Haven and Hartford, where the kids really strongly shared their feelings. Um, I have spoken to members of of, uh, of, of the uh, State Board of Ed and uh, CERC, who put together, who you know, had us use the Black and Latino Studies course and put put together that history. And what we find are the African American students are saying this is the first time they see this type of history. In their lives, it makes America, um, the history of America, more meaningful to them. Pat Wilson Phineas, if we had had the time, 
she says that it it makes her feel like she belongs here even more. If you you know if you know that you're here, you know you contributed, you know that you know thousands and thousands of African Americans fought in the American Revolution and the American Civil War. It changes the way you think of your your place in America. Just like when I found out my great great grandfather fought in you know was an Irish a little Irishman who fought in the American Civil War, it changed the way I thought about the Civil War. So uh, I guess that's the best answer I can give for that. Now, how um, in certain towns, the population of African-Americans are not existent or very next to none. When wanting to tell those stories of the enslaved in that area, how do you go about including African-American students? Because in reality, if it's going to be about the African-Americans and their heritage or their ancestors, how do you include the black students from those areas or from the schools that's close to those areas so that they are playing a meaningful part in that. Well, we haven't, we haven't figured that out yet. As you know, you know, we just, we're just getting through COVID and uh, we do, I would love, I would love more than anything if we could have our Guilford students present to our New Haven students and our New Haven students present to our Guilford students. That, that is, uh, I think a dream that I'm hoping to work with Connecticut Council for Social Studies to have happen. Uh, but truthfully, we contract with individual schools and they, you know, if we have an installation ceremony, uh, we try to partner with as many groups as we can. But right now it's, it's not there. It's not, you know, it's not our decision in a sense who a school partners with. But I am very, very open to any school that would like to uh, share their findings with another community. And, 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 and it's something that we have. We've, I've thought about from the very beginning of the project, but it hasn't come to fruition. And maybe, <laughs> maybe Tammy, you and I can talk more about how that might happen. We are, you know, uh, hoping to have a, a project, and in, in, um, we have a lot of projects that are adjacent. You know, the work in, that's done in West Hartford could be shared with the kids in Hartford. You know, so there's there's adjacent, but um, we'll say that we our numbers of of, of students of color are are rising um, quickly over the last couple of years. Uh, although there's still a lot of, you know, a lot of pieces left. Okay. Um, then we have a question from John. It's actually a twofold. So I'll do first and then I'll come back to the second. It says the African-American experience, history, and culture is more than just available primary documents and vital records. It's the actual lived experiences of a people, the family stories they pass down, and the social impacts experienced by their descendants over time. What qualifies the Witness Stone Project to direct the telling of these stories, providing the appropriate context and perspective of the African American experience? Um, that's a good question. I don't. I'm not. I don't believe I'm giving. You know, I'm not. We're not the experts here. We're. We're. We are teachers. We are educators. We. Uh, we do history. Um, I'm not. We're not claiming to be the only voice of african-american experience we don't claim to talk about african-american experiences today we claim to tell the truth about the past as best we can with the materials available um we you know Tammy, you know we <laughs> i was a one one person shop to begin with and uh formed, formed the board now we have a, a non-profit where we we, tr we try to have as much representation of people of color on that our, my board chair, who is very close to the project, she's not a figurehead, she is involved, she presents alongside me, she goes to schools with me. She, her voice is a voice of somebody who is, is a lived experience. But I, and we are also aiming to have the leadership of the Witness Notes Project change over the years, because I'm not gonna do this forever, and I would like to hand this to somebody who is uh, a person of color who loves to do this type of work too. So we're not the end of the story. We're not the, um, we're a, a tiny piece of the story and we hope we're, we do well. And every time we work with descendants and every every family that we've, we've identified and spoken to, they're happy to have, be part of the Witness Stones Project. So if we begin to get negative feedback, we hopefully can make adjustments accordingly, but we can't do everything. We can only, you know, we're, 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 we're trying to stay within our wheelhouse and we're trying to open our wheelhouse to have other voices in it. So um, that, that's it. Okay. Um, then he says, in addition to his first question, what if any methods do you employ to properly, accurately, and fully 
contextualize the experience of the African Americans you teach about? I, I, I think you know. I, I, I'll I'll say this is that we're aiming to do the best job we can. We're not aiming to fully do anything. We're aiming to tell these stories, and uh, we do it with partners um, who understand the work that we're doing. Um, we are trying to tell the best story we can with the evidence we have. We don't, we try not to speculate, but we sometimes surmise. We try not to um, overly interpret things, but sometimes we, we try to put things in context. And using the primary documents and especially the voices of enslaved people like James Morris and Jeffrey Brace and Venture Smith helps us do that. We also use you know, like we were going to be working with Chrissy Clark Pajara, who is a scholar in this area, as we do the Witness Stones project in uh, South County, Rhode Island. We've partnered with uh, Dr. Hassam Kwame Jeffries uh, for a presentation to the Connecticut Association of Independent Schools. We're working with as many scholars who, who would like to work with us, but we're not scholars. We are, we're laymen, we're, we're local historians and we're finding evidence of information that nobody ha else has uncovered. And in Connecticut, um, there's a lot of good work that's been done, but it's been done piecemeal, and we're trying to bring it together. And we're also sharing our findings with the Northeast Slavery Records Index so that we aren't going to be the last judges of whether this material is, is useful or not. We're going to be, the judges of that are going to be maybe the next generation. So we're trying to share as much of our information as we collect across the state with other people. But if John or anyone else would like to sit with me or sit with us or even uh, attend a, a, a presentation, uh, we'd be happy to do that um, because we really do try to sh be straight shooters. We're not here to um, go down one path so far that parents don't want their kids to learn this. We're trying to, we're trying to be educators like so many people out there are and trying to uh, tell a new story, an old story in a new way that helps us remember how enslaved people contributed to our community and also helps us understand how, what changes we need to make to make a better society. Okay. Thank you so much, Dennis. Let me just double check and make sure I got all questions. Okay. That seems to, that appears to be all of the questions that we have. Again, thank you so much, Dennis, for taking time out to explain the mission of the uh, Witness Stone Project, as well as to give background on your process. So thank you so very much for joining us. We appreciate you coming on Conversations at Noon. And to all of you in the audience, thank you so much for your time. Please join us next week, um, next month, the second Tuesday, not the fourth, um, December 6th, where we will do a year and reveal the Connecticut Freedom Trial. We'll talk about all of the good things that has happened, as well as talk about all of the things that is still to come. And also in January, we have a talk from the New London Custom House Executive Director. So we hope you'll join us then as well. But until the next time, thank you.